In our first video in this series, our free market climate journey began with a trip back to World War II. And throughout the 1980s, we discovered how the policies of that era brought about unforeseen yet significant climate benefits. And what connected these historical policies? Expanding freedom. This is the essence of the free market philosophy. So welcome back as we journey into the future. This is part two, where we'll see what those unintended climate victories of the past suggest for the climate strategies of the future. Freedom first. Our world is in a bind. Current technologies like concrete and fossil fuels contribute to climate change by admitting greenhouse gases. And yet the alternatives struggle to compete on price and performance. Every technology we have today can and must be improved in order to lower carbon emissions, lower cost and increase reliability. The next revolutionary idea could come from anywhere. Will it be Silicon Valley? Could it be Peru or Kenya? Governments picking winners and losers by handing out subsidies to their favourite technologies or even demonising and penalising others hinders progress. No matter how well-educated politicians might or might not be, no matter how well-intentioned or not, they lack the distributed computing power of the billions of people who comprise the global market. Any subsidy a politician might give would be essentially one person's often heavily lobbied opinion. Playing favourites doesn't just hurt the odds that better technologies may be developed. It builds walls, hindering countless other innovators that weren't picked, who may otherwise crack the code. Every innovative entrepreneur, investor and property owner deserves a fair chance to bring their vision to life, free from the unequal barriers or exclusive advantage that politicians often grant to cronies. The proof is in the pudding. Free economies are clean economies. In fact, that's the title of a study by Nick Loris. Nick compared the rankings of nations in the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom versus the Yale Index of Environmental Performance. He found almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. The freest nations also have the cleanest environments. Why? Time and time again, economic liberty has driven technological advancements that reduce harm to the environment whilst also advancing prosperity that in turn produces free and wealthy citizens who demand high environmental standards from both their products and their politicians. He also found that freedom impaired countries are likely to be environmentally impaired as well. Therefore, freedom first is the climate policy principle most likely to produce low carbon innovation and the least likely to harm the economy or the environment. Inclusive competition. In the first part of our series, we discovered the impact that competition and deregulation have had in the fight against climate change. Why? Competition forces companies to innovate, to keep and gain their market share. It allows consumers the choice to buy better, cheaper, cleaner products. Most importantly, it gives successful innovators the space to spread to new markets far and wide. By contrast, monopolies have a captive market. They keep out innovators and give consumers no choice. In a world bounded by monopolies and heavy regulation, both of which are hallmarks of government power, innovation is stifled. One economist studied competitive versus monopoly power markets in the United States. Competitive ones are decarbonizing 66% faster than the uncompetitive markets. Outside of the US, the consequences are even more dire. In many countries like Lebanon, crony-dominated monopoly power sectors often run on the dirtiest possible fuels, such as bunker fuel. Despite that, they can only deliver power for about four hours a day, meaning a dead stop to development. Nothing would be built without power. Women would be far less liberated without labour-saving appliances. Roughly 3 million women and children die every year from inhaling indoor smoke, from cooking over garbage fires, and from reading by kerosene lamps. All because too many governments treat power sectors, if not the entire economy, as monopoly fiefdoms for favoured political cronies. 
Opening the power markets of the world to cross-border competition is the quickest way to deliver sustainable development and low-carbon innovation whilst fixing a long list of major global problems. Private property rights with incentives for private conservation. Private entrepreneurs have proven time and time again to be the most effective drivers of innovation. Of course, entrepreneurship would be impossible without private property rights. Entrepreneurs require private ownership of their means of production and profits, or they simply have no incentive to create good things for others. Private property is essential for all the innovation we need to solve climate change. Private property is also essential to the conservation of nature. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the Amazon and other rainforests. Every year, millions of acres of rainforest lands are devastated by uncontrolled burning, releasing tons of emissions. Highly toxic illegal mining poisons rivers, soils and anyone nearby with arsenic and mercury. Why? Because governments own the vast majority of these rainforests, way more than they can reasonably protect. Rule of law is weak and most private property claims are poorly defined, often left unprotected by corrupt or intimidated officials and courts. Compare this to the United States with relatively strong property rights. Few will dare to slash, burn or mine illegally on the land of private US owners, probably well armed, backed by a strong rule of law. Those private owners have every incentive to care about their land and avoid anything that will damage its value. If private landowner operates a mine or oil rig, they generally do it carefully, following the law so as not to pollute their lands or those of their neighbours. Private action by people who care often provides more public benefits with far better impacts than the government. In our first video, we described how 1986 conservation easement tax deductions helped private landowners regrow around 20 million acres of US forests. Imagine the millions of acres of forests we could regrow if the Amazon had strong property rights. For now, we'll set aside the question of whether the government is the best protector of property rights. Either way, those rights are essential to the climate. Free trade. We've established the benefits of competition, but so far we've focused on domestic competition. A policy of free trade will extend those benefits by expanding competition across borders. In part one, we showed how international competition from Japanese auto manufacturers spread the innovation of low emission vehicles and forced European and US manufacturers to become more efficient. Crucially, before we even get larger consumer products like cars, free trade clarifies the proper use for those components that comprise cars. We want to inspire competitive bidding for all that copper and steel and iron and plastic that make a car. Because as Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises established, it is only through that bidding process that entrepreneurs can decide whether to make the cars at all, or whether that steel and iron might better serve people as a bridge or in a new apartment complex. Moreover, free trade incentivizes countries to focus on what they do best, even if they do other things well. This is known as competitive advantage. Think about LeBron James. At six foot eight, 270 pounds of muscle, he could likely play football and soccer better than most people in the world. But his basketball skills are so astronomically good that his talents are best dedicated to that sport. In a global market where countries can trade freely, Chile might discover it's exceptionally good at mining copper and that it should leave, say, aluminium mining to Australia. And those comparative advantages in the long run give people the kind of leisure time and disposable income to enjoy and therefore actually care about the environment. However, in a world where tariffs and embargoes restrict the global market, Chile is less likely to discover where its comparative advantage lies. But free trade is not just a matter of low tariffs and eliminating embargoes. Trade negotiators must also consider non-tariff trade barriers, including internal barriers to foreign competition and investment. Removing such barriers would likely accelerate the flow of money and goods across borders, leading to ever cleaner technologies. And it would have unintended benefits we can't even fathom yet. Clean tax cuts. 
In our first video, we showed how the supply side tax cuts of the 1980s accelerated innovation, which created unforeseen climate benefits. Clean tax cuts could replace all traditional subsidies, which pick winners and losers, favour the wealthiest investors and disadvantage smaller entrepreneurs and innovators. There are two kinds of clean tax cuts, equity and debt. Equity CTCs provide a simple way to reward low carbon innovation in sectors with the highest emissions. For a car company, the lower the average vehicle fleet emissions, the lower the tax rate. The same kind of CTCs could work across the major economic sectors that drive global greenhouse gas emissions, power generation, transport industry, and real estate. Debt CTCs work differently. They stipulate that no tax would be due on interest on bonds, loans, or even savings accounts, provided the proceeds are used to finance property, plants, and equipment. Debt CTCs could drive down the cost of capital and of cleaner products. They encourage investing in new equipment, which is usually cleaner and more efficient. Moreover, debt CTCs also have a superpower. They can act as international incentives for free markets and decarbonisation. That brings us to number six, global streamlining for innovation acceleration. There is no such thing as a national climate solution. Climate change poses a global challenge, and freedom must be an appealing solution to every nation. One proposal to accomplish that is the Climate and Freedom Accord. It proposes an international free market climate agreement. The accord offers a win-win deal. Nations would agree to phase out conventional climate policies, most of which constrict markets and innovation, and phase in free trade and open markets with property and economic rights for all. Theoretically, nations would want to do this because joining the accord would also bring access to international capital. It would do so by making those debt CDCs I mentioned internationally reciprocal. The accord calls these co-victory funds because they empower multiple nations to solve multiple problems simultaneously. In any nation that signs up for the accord, developers, entrepreneurs, investment funds and banks could raise tax-exempt debt and pull the proceeds to co-victory funds. These could then be invested in new, generally cheaper and more efficient plants and equipment in every accord nation. This mirrors what the supply siders did in the 1980s. They deregulated and opened US markets to competition and simultaneously slashed investment taxes to unlock capital flows. That fueled jobs and growth and reduced inflation by boosting supply. Co-victory funds offer a unique incentive for the global expansion of freedom. Moreover, they can be flexibly used by multiple nations to accomplish multiple goals. In my country, the UK, we might use them to expand post-Brexit trade partnerships or open up a new line of business for the London capital markets. Argentina might use them to attract foreign investment and simultaneously fight stagflation. Ukraine and Israel might use them to help rebuild their war-shattered infrastructures. Champions of social justice might use them to encourage investment to the global south. The US and Europe might use them to fix the underlying economic dysfunction driving trafficking, regional wars and the migrant crisis. Young people like myself care about the planet and worry about the climate. But we also worry about the tidal wave of bad climate policy that constricts human freedom whilst failing to bring down emissions. But the ideals of classical liberalism tell us that we can work together across borders to both expand freedom and fight climate change.